and I'd love to just welcome you to this week's Citizens Climate University. It's a weekly webinar program of Citizens Climate Lobbies that provides CCL supporters like you and I with access to in-depth training opportunities on topics related to climate change and effective climate advocacy. I'm your host, Brett Cease, and tonight's topic is going to be focused exclusively on an extended Q&A with Nathaniel Stinnett. So let's learn a little bit more about Nathaniel. Nathaniel founded the Environmental Voter Project in 2015 after a decade of experience as a senior advisor, consultant, and trainer for political campaigns and issue advocacy nonprofits. Hailed as a visionary by the New York Times and dubbed the voting guru, I love that one, by Grist Magazine itself, Stinnett is a frequent expert speaker on cutting edge campaign techniques and the behavioral science getting people out to vote. Nathaniel has held a variety of senior leadership and campaign manager positions on the U.S. Senate, congressional, state, and mayoral campaigns, and he sits on the board of advisors for MIT's Environmental Solutions Initiative, formerly an attorney at the international law firm of DLA Piper, LLP. So Nathaniel holds a BA from Yale and a JD from Boston College Law School, and he lives in the Boston, Massachusetts area with his wife and two charming children. So Nathaniel, we are so honored for you to be here. Thank you so much for making time. Thank you, Brett. Thank you so, so much. It is such a pleasure always working with you in particular, but also everybody at Citizens Climate Lobby. And uh, obviously there are a lot of things that all of us in the climate movement find meaning in, but certainly the solidarity of working with like-minded people with like-minded goals and with like-minded organizations is really just a, a special blessing. So thank you to the CCL family. Thank you to everybody on Zoom and everybody on YouTube and, and in the other uh, places. Uh, I joined the monthly call uh, about a week and a half ago, maybe it was two weeks ago. Uh, and what we're going to do is I'm going to go over the very, very brief presentation that I made then. And then the idea is, whereas a week and a half ago, we only had five minutes of Q&A, this time we wanna have 35 or 40 minutes of Q&A. That's why this is billed as an extended Q&A. So uh, for those of you who were there at that monthly call, please forgive me if some of this sounds familiar, uh, but maybe you would like a refresher before we start diving into questions. I am going to do these four things. So one, a very, very brief introduction to the Environmental Voter Project. And I mean very brief. Uh, we have a Q&A. If you are interested in certain aspects of our work, I really look forward to digging into it in the Q&A. But we're gonna start with that. Then we're gonna get into the recent results that we have had in turning non-voting environmentalists into consistent voters. Three, we'll then get into some volunteer opportunities over the next three and a half months. And yeah, the midterms are only three and a half months away. And then four, we'll have our extended Q&A. So let's start with what the Environmental Voter Project is, what we do and why. We are a nonpartisan nonprofit that is laser focused on what you see here we turn non-voting environmentalists into consistent voters. That's it. We find already persuaded environmentalists who don't vote, and then we turn them into better voters. What that also means is that we don't do some of the things that you typically think of when you think of other environmental nonprofits. So for instance, we don't lobby for particular policies. We don't endorse candidates. We don't even try to get people to care more about climate or the environment. A good way to think of us is we're not even in the opinion changing or mind changing space. Instead, we are solely in the behavior changing space. That's not to say that that other stuff isn't extraordinarily important, of course it is. But what we try to do is identify the people who don't need their minds changed. They don't need their opinions changed. They care so much about climate and the environment that it's their number one priority. They're just not voting. And that allows us to bypass the hard, expensive stuff of politics, which is changing minds, and go right to the slightly easier stuff, which is changing people's behavior and turning them into more consistent voters. And the reason we focus on this niche is that it's actually a pretty big niche. 
you'll see we identified 10.1 million already registered voters who list climate or the environment as their number one priority, who just plain old didn't cast a ballot in the 2016 presidential election. We think that looking at public voting histories in current voter files, there are over 13 million already registered super environmentalists who have never voted in a midterm. And so over the next three months, when we are all thinking about these enormously important midterm elections, we know that there are 13 million plus already registered voters who care deeply about climate and the environment, who we have to assume are unlikely to show up because they've never voted in a midterm election before or any other election of lower or equal turnout. This is how large a population that we are targeting. And I see some of you kind of shaking your heads in frustration and I get it. Like, I, I understand that it's frustrating that all these environmentalists don't vote. But what I'd also like to suggest to you that it's an extraordinary opportunity we live in a moment in time where it's become increasingly hard to change people's opinions and minds about anything. And what these numbers represent are people who don't need their minds changed. These are people who like you shake them awake at night and they're gonna scream climate change. They're just not voting. And so what they need is a behavioral intervention. And I won't claim that's easy, of course it isn't, but it is easier than changing minds. It is easier than changing opinions. And so this is what we focus on at the Environmental Voter Project. We're totally nonpartisan. We just are data scientists who find these non-voting environmentalists, and then we leverage the latest behavioral science to turn them into better voters. Very briefly, and forgive me if this is very brief, but we can get into more nuance and detail during the Q&A if you're interested. Very briefly, we take a three-step process. The first, identification. We work with data scientists to build predictive models that identify these voters. What do I mean by that? Well, these are the same tools that modern political campaigns now use to target voters. If you have in your mind the idea that you know campaigns target soccer moms or NASCAR dads or other broad demographic groups, that's not how it's done anymore. What campaigns do is they build these predictive models. And the way they do it, and the way we do it, is we will poll tens of thousands of people per state. These are huge polls. We'll only ask them one question. We'll say, what's your number one most important political priority? And let's say out of 10,000 people in Florida, 1,000, say climate or clean air or clean water. Well, then we can work with data scientists to figure out, okay, what do we know about these thousand people who we can identify on voter files who just told us that climate's their number one priority? What voter file data is there? What census data is there? What publicly available behavioral or consumer data is there? We only use publicly available data, but there's a lot of it out there. And that allows us to start building profiles of who these super environmentalists are and identifying other potential super environmentalists in Florida. And it's a long iterative process, but at the end of it, what we're able to do is find people who we think are environmentalists and then call them up and fine tune our model and then fine tune it some more. And at the end of the day, we can assign a score from zero to 100 to every single person in a state voter file letting us know how likely they are, not just to care about climate, but literally listed as their number one priority over all other issues. And then when we think we've got it just right, we say, thank you very much, data scientists, and we ship out our list to a completely different competing data science and polling firm. And we say, can you check these first group, you know, their work? Can you call up the people who have an 85 to 100 score which means they have an 85% or higher likelihood of listing climate as their top priority. We say, can you call these people up and just ask them off the top of their head what their number one issue is? Every single time we do that, at least 85% of the respondents say, oh, uh, climate change, why do you ask? These are frighteningly accurate ways of identifying voters. 
And they're so successful, not because we're particularly good or bad at this. This is just where this, this concept of predicting, predictive modeling is. All right, the next step is you don't need data scientists to figure out which of those environmentalists vote and which don't vote. That's public record. So then we just isolate those super environmentalists who don't vote and we move to step two, mobilization. At that point, we can be completely agnostic with our messaging. We can work with behavioral scientists around the country to figure out which messages work best with which subgroups of these low propensity voters who care deeply about the environment just to do one thing, and that is turn them into better voters. We canvas and call and mail and send digital ads. We run hundreds of randomized control trials each year to figure out which messages work best just at doing this one thing, and that is turning non-voting environmentalists into consistent voters. And then the third thing is habit reinforcement. We are not some secret election winning strategy. Uh, I hate to break it to you, but talking to really infrequent voters is not a very efficient way to win one-off elections. Does that end up happening every now and then anyway? Sure, but that's not our goal. Our goal is to address that initial imbalance that I showed you. Our goal is to, to get those tens of millions of non-voting environmentalists into the electorate because we know from peer reviewed studies and also just from tons of campaign experts that politicians don't care about the opinions of non-voters. They only care about the opinions of voters. And it is literally public record who votes and who doesn't. And so we take this habit reinforcement, this third step very seriously. We don't just cherry pick big sexy federal elections and then do nothing the two years in between. Instead, we work year round in local, state, federal, primary, general, special elections, using every single one of them as a behavioral intervention opportunity to change people's habits. And you don't need to be a behavioral psychologist to know that if you're trying to change someone's habits, you can't just parachute in once every two years and expect it to work. And the same goes for voting. I mean, if you were trying to get in shape, you wouldn't go to the gym once every two years. And so we use every election as a way to change people's voting habits. All right. Now into some of the results. Last year, in an odd year, when most people were taking the, the, the year off from politics, we were active in 381 different elections. And many CCL members were involved in contacting these low propensity environmental voters along with us. Were all 381 of these elections important for environmental policymaking? No, no, many of them weren't. But all of them were important if what you're trying to do is change people's behavior. And so we took all of these elections really, really seriously. And as you'll see in the next few slides, doing this year round work, never taking an election off, ends up having really extraordinary cumulative results. But before I get to the cumulative results, let's just look at the election specific results. When we measure our impact on specific elections, we submit our work to something called randomized control trials. Very briefly, what that is, is let's say we start off with a big round number. Let's say we've got a million super environmentalists in Florida who have never voted in a midterm. What we do not do is immediately start communicating with all million of them. Instead, we randomly divide them into two groups. One of them is a control group, and we never talk to them. The remaining, it, it, this, this uh, slide makes it seem like it's 50-50. Usually, it's about 20%, 80%. So the remaining 80% is in what's called our treatment group. They're the ones who get our behavioral interventions, or in like non-academic talk, they're the ones we canvas and call and send mail and digital ads to. Then the election happens. And remember what I've said a few times now already, whether you vote or not is public record. And so a few months after the election, voter files are updated. And at that point, we can compare turnout in our control group of infrequent environmental voters to our treatment group of infrequent environmental voters who we actually communicated with. And at that point, 
what that allows us to do is isolate what our sole impact was on turnout while controlling for all outside variables. Because even if the Biden campaign spends a billion dollars in Florida, well, we've controlled for that. Unless they hacked into our system and decided to only talk to people in our treatment group, we have controlled for that. If it rains in Miami and that depresses turnout, well, there are just as many Miamians in our control group as in our treatment group. We have controlled for that. And this allows us not only to measure our impact, but also to measure and experiment with which messages work best at turning these non-voting environmentalists into better voters. Just last year in 2021, we were able to isolate statistically significant impacts on turnout as much as four percentage points in local elections, as much as 0.8 percentage points in statewide primaries, and as much as 1.2 percentage points in statewide general elections. Those numbers don't seem big to you. Ask Donald Trump how big a deal 1.2% is in Pennsylvania. They're big numbers. And that 0.9% that you see in Georgia there that was for those two US Senate runoffs that happened on January 5th. A billion dollars with a B was spent in Georgia for those two US Senate runoffs. Little Old Environmental Voter Project only spent 550,000. And still our randomized control trial showed that we could cut through all of that billion dollars worth of static and isolate that we were solely responsible for a statistically significant increase in turnout of 0.9 percentage points among the 330,000 environmentalists we were targeting. Was that good enough to swing the election itself? No, it wasn't. But there are very few, if any, other groups who can say amidst a billion dollars worth, worth of static, we were able to isolate what our sole impact was on turnout. And we're very proud of that. What we are more proud of though, oddly enough, is four weeks later, we were right back at it in Georgia, mobilizing a few hundred voters in a district attorney primary. And that's what I meant about the important cumulative impact of this year round work. Because even though we're excited about these results, when we look at our cumulative impact over the last six years, you can see these are the 12 states that we're in, but the darker colored ones, those are the ones that we've been in long enough that we feel comfortable starting to measure long-term impact. Over the last six years, we have communicated with 8.6 million unique individual voters, all of whom by definition were unlikely to vote or else we wouldn't be talking to them. And by the end of last year, 1,030,912 of them had become such consistent voters that they had voted in their most recent federal election their most recent state election, and their most recent local election. That is what we are truly proud of. Now, to be clear, this metric, this long-term metric, this does not have the same scientific statistical rigor of a randomized control trial. I cannot claim to you that we are solely responsible for turning a million non-voters into super voters, but I can say we're pretty darn responsible. There are no other organizations that are working year round in 381 elections in an odd year. We're really the only group that's doing this year in, year out in local, state, and federal, organ and federal elections. All right, I'm going to speed to the finish because this is supposed to be an extended Q&A, not an extended presentation. Uh, so the last thing is what we see heading into the midterms and how CCL members can get involved. So these are the 17 states that the Environmental Voter Project operates in. I'm happy to get into in the Q&A if you're interested why we're in these 17 states and not the others. Uh, but in these 17 states, we have identified 5.8 million already registered voters who have a very high likelihood of listing climate and the environment as their top priority yet they have never voted in a midterm. And again, not to be creepy, but like we know them by name and street address. They are marked on voter files. And that's why we are able to canvas them and call them and send them letters 
Uh, and that's why we are able to enable you to do that and to deliver this nonpartisan yet proven messaging to them to get them to vote. The state by state breakdown is what you see here. And I won't go through every state, you guys can read them, uh, but I'll explain what the columns mean. The number of our targets are that second column from the left. So you'll see in Arizona, we have identified 249,841 of these super environmentalists who have never voted in a midterm. And to be clear, this is after removing our control group. So remember, we submit all of our work to randomized control trials so we can see what works and what doesn't. After removing that control group, we've still got that 250,000. All right, well, what does that mean in a state like Arizona? That's the next column. To provide some context, we wanted to let you know how many ballots were cast in Arizona last time there was a midterm. And you'll see it was 2,384,000. So what that means is the size of EVP's target audience in a state like Arizona is so big that it would be equal to 10.5% of all ballots that were cast last time there was a midterm. And as you'll see, there are some very uh, crucial states over the next three and a half months where our target populations there are enormous. I mean, look at Pennsylvania. I mean, like every other person you bump into in Pennsylvania is a non-voting environmentalist. And this is an enormous opportunity because we know who these people are and we've got hundreds of randomized control trials now over the last six years revealing to us which messages work best to get them to vote. Just to narrow in on a few of those states, although we are active in all 17 of those states, you'll see some of them are really, really competitive. And I'm not even talking about the local races and state races that are going on. A lot of these states where we have lots of targets have a lot on the line. All right, before we get to the Q&A, this is how we love working with CCL members. So first off, you can go to our website, environmentalvoter.org slash get dash involved and sign up for any phone bank or canvassing uh, training that you see there. Any phone bank, if you sign up, it will start with a training. We will give you the script. We will tell you exactly what to say and walk you through it. And if you have questions, you can just get right off and ask the, the webinar leader how to do it. But we know this works and we only ask our volunteers to do stuff that we have randomized control trials proving to us will work. If you want to volunteer as a group, you can not only email Shannon, our organizing director, to set up a special volunteer opportunity for your CCL group, but we are also holding over the next two weeks two special train the trainer sessions just for CCL members. We know a lot of you want to have special phone banks with your groups. And so we are holding a session where we can train you to then host your own phone banks. And then finally, just for any more information about our results or our studies or our press or our bios or anything, we're at environmentalvoter.org. And I'll close before we get to the Q&A by just saying, even if you don't do any of this stuff, take it from someone who lives the behavioral science of voting pretty much every day, your superpower is your social influence on your peer groups. People at work, people at school, people in the pickup line as you're getting your children from, from school or in your uh, faith community, people look to you for cues as to what it means to be a good environmentalist or what it means to be a good grandparent or, or what it means to be a good citizen. And so it is incumbent upon all of us to be loud and proud about the fact that we are voting. The more people in our peer groups who know that we take voting seriously, the more likely we are to get all of them to vote. We are social animals and we are always looking around to figure out what the right behavior is. And so we need to make sure that everybody around us knows that being a voter is the right thing to do. All right, with that, 
we've got we've got a good 30 35 minutes for the extended q a so i am excited oh so are we nathaniel and you have already gotten a lot of questions here uh this is exactly what we were hoping for thank you so much for making time and grounding us especially as we began with that backstory uh so that we can be a little bit more targeted in our discussion um so if you're all right with it we'll just take them from the top and uh, feel free to take that uh, whatever cadence you want. Uh, obviously, we've got uh, you know many many questions. So uh, have have fun here, Nathaniel, and keep typing and uploading those for uh, those that haven't joined in yet. Great, great. So I will uh, I will start at the top here, and for those who are on the phone, I will uh, I'll read the questions out loud. Do you have any studies that show whether more environmentally minded politicians are being elected, at least in part, because of EVP's work? In other words, are the environmental voters voting for candidates who care about the environment? Really, really good question. So there's stuff that we know and stuff that we don't know. So first, yes, there are many peer reviewed studies that show uh, not that EVP is electing more environmentally minded politicians, but just in general, that politicians are much, much more responsive to the issue priorities of voters than they are to the priorities of non-voters. There are lots of peer-reviewed studies that show that. So that's the first thing. We know that if you get people who care about a particular set of issues to start voting, there are lots of peer-reviewed studies that show the politicians and the policymakers follow. So that's the first thing. The second thing that I think is important to understand is although it is unlikely we will ever have a politician say, you know, I wouldn't have voted for that bill if it weren't for the rascally voters forcing me to do something I, I hate. You know, like, like that's unlikely to happen. What we are seeing is a significant number of places, especially in state and local campaigns, but also in federal, but especially in state and local, where when we started at the Environmental Voter Project four or five years ago, Nobody was sending mailers out about climate and the environment at all. Nobody was doing digital ads about climate and the environment at all. And now they are doing it all the time, all the time. Now, is that as hard a piece of evidence as you know peer reviewed academic studies? No, no, it's anecdotal evidence, but it's really consistent. It's really consistent and just like for a really good anecdote that certainly strikes home for me, you know, you know what I did before I ran the Environmental Voter Project? My last job was running a mayoral campaign here in Boston. My candidate lost, closest mayoral campaign in modern Boston history. And I was deeply frustrated by the fact that we couldn't talk about climate and the environment. Because every time we did a poll of likely voters, it was nowhere, less than 1%. Well, a year ago, we elected a mayor who is known as the Green New Deal mayor, Michelle Wu. And regardless of what you think of her or her policies, it is very, very clear to me that the ground has shifted in the city of Boston. And now when you are running for municipal office, instead of all the voters saying that they care about public schools and potholes, most of them care deeply about climate and the environment and 10 to 15% of them listed as their number one priority. So those are the types of changes that we're seeing. Those are the types of changes that we're seeing. All right, next question. How does EVP know that specific people are environmental voters but don't vote? Great question. So let me take the second part first, whether they vote or not. That is public record. And you can be excused if you don't know this, but you can't be excused if after this presentation you don't know this. So I'm gonna say it a few times because if there is only one thing you take away from this extended Q&A, let it be what I'm about to say. Who you vote for is secret, but whether you vote or not is public record. It is public record. And not only that, but that piece of information that hopefully is now burned into your, your brain is the single 
most important building block to how all policy is made in the United States and how all campaigns are run. Because believe me, if you are running for governor and you literally can just open up your laptop and look at a list of who votes for governor in your state and who doesn't, and you have limited time and limited money, who do you think your campaign is gonna focus on? Not the people who have proven over and over again that they don't show up. When you're running for governor or mayor or president, your only goal is to get 50% plus one of the vote on a Tuesday in November, period. And if you know there is a huge population of people who don't vote, believe me, you don't talk to them, you don't target them, and you sure as heck don't poll them to figure out what issues they care about. And we can think about like how cynical and awful that is, but it's no different from like any other marketplace we're used to, right? Like Starbucks doesn't care about people who don't drink coffee. Ford Motor Company doesn't do market research with three-year-olds. Like three-year-olds don't buy cars. And politicians have a list of who votes and who doesn't vote. And surprise, surprise, they don't care about the non-voters. So it's really important to understand that whether you vote or not is public record. Okay, the first part of the question, how does EVP know that specific people are environmentalists? So we, we went over the non-voting part. This gets to what I mentioned before about building these predictive models. And I thought that someone might ask this question because I know that I breeze through that. And so I am going to share another Oh, no, I shouldn't share it. Should I, can I share another slide? Great. I will share this to go into a little bit more detail about how these predictive models are built, because I realize it's a little confusing, but as we head into the next three and a half months, this is how all of the sophisticated gubernatorial and US Senate and even congressional campaigns are targeting people. So we should be aware of it. To build these predictive models on voter files, we start by surveying huge numbers of people and ask them what their number one issue priority is. Then we isolate the people who say that climate or other environmental issues are their, is their number one priority. Then we try to figure out, okay, what do we know about these people? What are their demographic indicators? You know, are they young? Are they old? What are their ethnic indicators? But also we start looking at some publicly available behavioral and consumer data. And then we try to start figuring out what the patterns and correlations are and try to see if we can find other people like them. And when we start digging into it with data scientists, we can start seeing, oh, well, maybe there are some data points that are really helpful in finding other people like that, like, oh, turns out in Florida, if you're a forestry employee, you're 11 times more likely than the average Floridian to list climate as your top priority. Oh, and if you have a new home, but no kids, you're six times as likely as the average Floridian. Ooh, basketball fans are more likely than baseball, hockey, and football fans. And so if you subscribe to exercise magazines, you're twice as likely. Now, none of these data points are predictive on their own. But when you start combining them all together into big bunches, well, then you can start really accurately identifying people who have a really high likelihood of listing climate as their top priority. It can be like, oh, you know, if you bought a Volvo between eight and 10 years ago and live within five miles of Orlando and you're a Latina grandmother who subscribes to National Geographic, you've got like a 96% likelihood of listing climate as your top priority. And then what we do is we assign scores from zero to 100 to every single one of those voters. And this is a distribution of every single voter in the Florida voter file. And as you'll see, there are millions of them who have less than a 30% likelihood of listing climate as a top priority. That's not very surprising, is it? There are a lot of people then in the middle and then kind of a hump towards the end. But then over there on that right side, I mean, there are millions of people who have an 85% likelihood and higher of, again, not just caring about climate and the environment, but listing it as their number one priority over all other issues. 
And so what does that mean for the person who asked this question? Does this mean that we know for a fact because we've spoken to all 15 million people in Florida who the super environmentalists are? No, it's a probabilistic model. But what we also know is that these probabilistic models are frighteningly accurate, frighteningly accurate. And what we also know is that when we call these people up, very, very few of them are confused and wondering like, why the heck is this environmental group calling me? These are really, really accurate models. So that's how we find these super environmentalists who don't vote. All right. Uh, let me click on the top thing here. All right. What's your best elevator pitch to a friend to join you for a phone bank? All right. Uh, one, you're not trying to convince anybody to vote for a particular candidate. And so you're bypassing like the thing that people are most squeamish about. Two, you're not trying to convince anybody to care about a particular issue. So you're also bypassing the second most thing that like people get squeamish about. All you're doing is encouraging people to vote. And what we know from all of our research is that even people who don't vote still buy into the societal norm that voting is a good thing. So most people want to be thought of as good voters. So the elevator pitch is you are asking people to do something that deep down they already want to do, and they certainly want to tell a stranger that they want to do it. And so are you never hung up on? No, of course you get hung up on every now and then. But for something that is proven to work, boy, is this kind of like light and fluffy and cuddly and easy to do. This is a lot easier than knocking on a door and trying to convince a climate denier to start caring about climate change. This is a lot easier than trying to convince someone to vote for your candidate. You're just trying to get environmentalists to go out the door on election day. It's easy and it works. All right, where do I find hope most days and in the darkest days? Great question. I think first, I want to say that it's okay to not always feel hopeful. You know, I, I, I'm not sure it is always helpful to pretend that like everything is fine and we must be positive all the time. You know, I've got two little kids, uh, they're five and eight. And uh, there's this really popular cartoon show that maybe some of you are aware of called Daniel Tiger. And it's really great about getting to know your emotions. And there's this line that says, you know, he often says, it's okay to be angry. It's not okay to hurt someone, or it's okay to be sad. It's not okay to lose control. And I feel like that, you know, that, that's a good, <laughs> that's a good lesson. It's okay to be overwhelmed sometimes. Don't, don't feel that you have to be hopeful and happy all the time. Like things are objectively not so good. That being said, where do I find hope? First off, in solidarity. I think solidarity is a really like underused, powerful concept and powerful word. You know, it, I've never met Brett, never met him. He lives in Minnesota, I live in Boston. We've like met over Zoom calls the past three years because these organizations that we're involved in have similar goals and there's something just really empowering about relationships like that. The fact that even with all of these scary, awful, dark things in the world happening, knowing that there are people who you just plain old don't know, know that well, who have the same goals and the same worries as you and are putting in the same work and the same time to try to, to, try to create change is hopeful and empowering and, and strengthening. And I think it, it's just being able to see people like this and know that there are other people with the same worries and cares as you does create hope. It really does. The second thing is, you know, by definition, we are all here because we care about like 
two enormous crises, right? Like the climate crisis and the democracy crisis. Those are really big. And I can guarantee you there isn't a single one of us who is gonna solve those by themselves. And so the other thing, other way that I find hope is by trying to make things small, trying to figure out, well, like, okay, what can I do? I know I'm not gonna wake up tomorrow and have solved all this stuff. So what is a goal that, that I can win? And, you know, right before this session, the Environmental Voter Project had a phone bank in Arizona. There were like 62, 63 people calling. I, I think it's safe to say it's probably the biggest phone bank that Arizona has seen this year, even with two tight gubernat uh, gubernatorial in a US Senate race. Each individual person on that phone bank probably didn't have more than 15 or 20 conversations. Maybe some of them had 40 or 50, but I got to see the dashboard on the back end. And I got to see that we had over 1600 conversations with super environmentalists who had never voted before. And that's this idea of like finding these small goals that you know you can accomplish. And if you do that, not only do you feel hopeful, but big cumulative things really, really start happening quickly. So that's where I find hope. That's where I find hope. Uh, next question, EVP's website has a write postcards. Uh, whoop. I think I'm, oh yeah, there it is. Uh, oh, that, okay, that's been downvoted. Don't worry, I'll get to that. Okay, do you try to identify and reach people through their social media accounts? Uh, we do do digital advertisements to the individuals who we target. So yes, we do deliver digital ads to these low propensity environmental voters that we're targeting. Some of them are over social media. Some of them are what's known as uh, sort of display ads. So if you go to a website, you know, read a CNN article, you'll see a banner digital ad from us. So yes, we do do that, but it isn't solely through social media. But yes, we do do that. Next question, EVP's website has a write postcards tab, but no opportunities for volunteering. Will this become available this election cycle? Great question. So we have done, I think, four postcarding campaigns this year so far. The one that we will be doing this fall is into New Mexico. We had had over 600 people write postcards for us just this year, just in the first you know, six months of 2022. And so when we decided we were going to do that postcarding campaign this fall, we wanted to first open it up to the volunteers who had already done the postcarding with us. That immediately filled all of the postcarding that was available. So we are now thinking about whether we are going to open up another campaign. So that's the long way of me, be, of me saying, eh, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know if there will be another one available. Uh, at the moment, no. But if there is one that becomes available, we will immediately email everybody on our list so that they know, so that they know. And I know that's disappointing. I don't like delivering news that is disappointing like that, but it's better than not given the honest truth. So that's, that's where we are on that. What we do know is that canvassing and calling works. It works. We have the receipts to prove it. We have randomized control trials proving it. All right, the next question, please rank in order of potency, which action has the greatest impact? Canvassing, postcards, phone banking, texting, others. Great question. I will answer even more that's in that question. I'll, I wanna talk about sort of two variables that we measure these interventions on. One is the greatest impact or effectiveness. The other is efficiency because we're not just worried about what has the highest ceiling on turnout, but also uh, what is the what creates the most votes per dollar spent or what creates the most votes per volunteer hour spent. So we care about effectiveness 
and efficiency. So first, let me talk about effectiveness. Even in this newfangled world with all of this, you know, with digital ads and remote this and remote that, the single most effective way to turn non-voters into voters remains knocking on someone's door and having a plain old fashioned conversation with them. Canvassing has the highest ceiling for boosting turnout. A good canvassing campaign, depending on the election, can boost turnout as much as five or six percentage points over the control group. In a high turnout midterm, it's not gonna be that high, but, in a high, but even in a high midterm election, canvassing is still going to be the most effective, without a doubt. After that, direct mail letters. So not ones that are written by volunteers, but direct mail letters. Now, obviously the messaging matters, and I'm happy to get into some of the behavioral science informed messaging that we use in letters and digital ads and other things if people are interested. But next comes those letters. Next comes digital ads, then texting and phone banking. And last is postcarding. So that's the order of effectiveness. So sort of the, the ceiling that you can boost turnout. Now let's talk about efficiency. What is either the cheapest per, per vote gained or takes the least amount of volunteer time per vote gained? Well, canvassing uh, takes a lot of time, right? So even though each conversation is enormously powerful, maybe you can knock on 50 doors. Maybe if you're lucky, you have 15 conversations in a two hour shift. Whereas in two hours, you might be able to text 1,500 people. And so texting, even though it doesn't have nearly as high a ceiling on turnout as canvassing does, if canvassing can boost turnout as much as five or six percentage points, texting is rarely above 0.7 or 0.8 percentage points, but you can just hit so many more people, so many more people. So texting is probably the most efficient. Uh, then probably comes phone banking. Then uh, probably again, comes mail and digital ads. Postcards, once again, comes in last place in the efficiency. Postcards, you know, for three or four years, the Environmental Voter Project refused to do postcards because we had yet to see a single randomized control trial proving that they had a statistical significant impact on turnout. And we don't feel comfortable asking our donors to pay for or our volunteers to spend their time doing something that we don't know works. Then last year, we started to see some randomized control trials that showed if the postcards are designed in a specific way and they have a specific kind of message, they actually can increase turnout. And that's why we started doing them, but started doing them in a very controlled way. Not a use whatever design you want, write whatever you want, we actually know that kind of doesn't work. But instead, use our design, write exactly what we tell you, we know that does work. But I also wanna be clear, you know, if you send 100 postcards, well, if you send 200 postcards, maybe you make one or two additional voters out of sending those 200 postcards. Is it worth it? Yeah. Any marginal increase in turnout that we can prove is statistically significant is worth it in an election cycle like this. But I also want to be honest about which is the most efficient. You can have 40, 50, 60 times more conversations on the phone during that time. I mean, it, even more than that, I don't know how long it takes to write 200 postcards. So they're not as efficient. The final thing I'll say is we know that all of these things have a cumulative impact. If you canvas, call, text, mail, and send digital ads, and send volunteer postcards to the same voter, you do not have a leveling off on your ROI. You do not have a leveling off on the impact. It's just like a layer cake. 
the likelihood of increasing their turnout just gets higher and higher. And so what you want to do is you want to hit people with multiple interventions. All right, let me get to, oh, I said uh, there are more responses here. Okay. Uh, does EVP have internships? Yes, we do. If you go to the jobs tab of our website right now, I believe that we are already accepting applications for our fall internship program. Our summer program has already started, but we will also be doing it in the fall. It's completely remote. It's completely remote. Uh, how does EVP pick its states? Yeah, how do we pick, it, uh, pick our states? Why are we in those 17 states? So let me uh, once again share my screen just so you can see what these states are while I'm talking about them. So these are the 17 states that we are operating in. You may notice many of them are purple states, but not all of them. Some are blue states, some are red states. You may also notice that there are some really politically important states that are not included. Like, hey, why are we in Wisconsin? Why are we in Michigan or Minnesota or places like that? All very good questions. Here's what's going on. First, our first and most important criteria is we work in states where we have identified disproportionately large populations of non-voting environmentalists. We need to have a big target audience. We need a big fat denominator or else it kind of doesn't matter how good we are at this. We're not gonna change policy making. You know, if there are 20 non-voting environmentalists in Idaho, who cares if they all start voting? <laughs> like that's not gonna move the dial on anything. And so we like to find these states that have these disproportionately large populations of non-voting environmentalists. Second thing, please remember, we are not running after the election of the moment. We are here in these states for the long term, trying to change the number of environmentalists in the electorate so that we can change policymaking, not just at the federal level, but also at the state and local level. And so you'll see there are some states that maybe, you know, they're head scratchers if all you think about are opportunities to move federal policymaking. But we've come to think that they are still really, really important for local and state policymaking. So what's an example? Well, New York. I mean, New York happens to be extraordinarily important for federal policymaking. They have eight tight congressional races this fall, but New York is kind of like California in that like if, if that state decides to do something, it kind of drags the global economy with it. The governor of New York and the mayor of New York City, regardless of who they are, just, just that position, I mean, those are two of the most powerful climate policy making positions in the entire world. Third criteria, we've come to realize that no matter how smart we are, no matter how much we learn from all of these experiments we run on the right messages to deliver to the right people, our stubbornness is much more impactful than our intelligence. By which I mean, if we are able to talk to a voter eight times in a year instead of one, we will of course have a much, much bigger cumulative impact. And what a lot of people don't think of a lot is that different states have different election, not just election calendars, but a, a different cadence to their elections. Oregon, for good government reasons, has gotten rid of all their odd year elections. They only have even year elections. Now, there are good policy reasons for that, right? If all of your municipal elections coincide with big federal elections, more people vote for mayor and city council. That's a good thing, but it's bad if you're in the behavior changing business. That means you can only talk to your targets once or twice every two years. Whereas in a place like Georgia, like there's some people we talk to eight, 10 times a year because everything goes to a runoff in Georgia. And so that's the third criteria that we use, not just policy making opportunities, not just large target populations, but also really active election calendars because that helps us get these great cumulative results. All right, I think we might have time for one more question. 
I think we're at time with this last question here. I, I think uh, it's the, the most popular remaining one. I want to be mindful of your time here too, Nathaniel. So it's a good one to take us home on. All right. For some reason, I'm not seeing it now. So could you read it out to me now? Yeah, it is. I love EVP. I've been phone banking for years. I'd love to know from Nathaniel, when you founded EVP, did you <laughs> ever dream that it would be this big and important? Uh, that is a very kind question to ask is the last question. Thank you, whoever voted it up there and, and asked it. Uh, no, no. I have no idea I would do this. Um, you know, I'm not someone who was always ached to be an entrepreneur. I was pretty comfortable working at a law firm, running off and running political campaigns and taking leaves of absence and going back to it. But I was very mindful of this particular problem that I was seeing and that there were particular solutions that I think I could bring to bear on it. And our first child was being born and I have the best wife in the entire world and she was just really a, a good friend at walking me through thinking about this and, and whether it was okay for me to not work for a few years and think about starting a nonprofit. Like, who the hell does that? And it, we were also very lucky that I had the money to not be paid and start a nonprofit. Most people don't have that privilege. Um, but throughout all of it, we would always say to each other, well, like, you know, most of these things fail, right? And I'd say, yeah, yeah, I know most of these things fail. Uh, obviously, I didn't want it to fail, but no, I, I never dreamt that it would become this big. And, and probably the biggest surprise, I mean, I'll say this, I'm not surprised that we can identify these people and get them to vote. Like in some ways, like our, our success, uh, our, our success metrics don't surprise me as much as all of you surprise me. I mean, the truth is, it's the fact that we've gotten thousands of volunteers to do this with us that surprises me. I mean, let's face it. This is like the nerdiest thing you could imagine, right? Like, this is really nerdy. <laughs> it's like, use data science, identify these environmentalists who aren't voting, then use behavioral science and turn them to vote. And no, we're not going to endorse candidates. And we're going to get these great results by working in all these elections that people don't care about. Like, th this is not something that I expected to, for volunteers to get really excited about. And, and in many ways, that's what's been most surprising. And I can't take any credit for that. Our organizing team is just extraordinary. And they realize how much people care about results. They realize that if you're going to give of your time, you want to know it's making a difference. And it, it's created just this wonderful community of volunteers. And that's what I find most surprising and what I'm most grateful for. Well, we couldn't have been more grateful. Uh, speaking of gratitude, Nathaniel, for you giving your evening here to join us and to obviously be here live and inspire all of us on the line, whether it's YouTube or Zoom or for, like I had shared with you earlier, all of our listeners later on. I know that uh, one of our most popular videos still that people are still watching today was your most recent uh, extended Q&A that you gave with us last time. So I know this one's going to rank just as high up there given the wisdom and the empowerment and just the opportunity that you're providing all of us as CCL volunteers to make a difference in this critical time right now. So stay safe over there. Keep up the amazing visionary work that EVP is doing. And we look forward to partnering with you in all ahead because it's critical, critical work we're doing. Thank you for listening to this episode of Citizens Climate Lobby's training program. You can tune into more episodes anywhere podcasts are available. Inspired by what you heard today? Join Citizens Climate Lobby to advocate for bipartisan climate solutions. Go to community.citizensclimate.org to find more trainings, resources, your local chapter, national action teams, discussion forums, and more. Be sure to like our Facebook page and follow us on Twitter and Instagram at Citizens Climate. We also invite all of our listeners to subscribe to our YouTube channel for more inspiration. Like what you hear? Recommend us to your friends and make sure to give us a five-star rating. It helps us show up on other listeners' feeds. Feel free to pass on any suggestions for future episodes in the comments as well. And together, we are creating the political will for a livable world.